Hi, I'm Rebecca Suarez, and I'm going to be giving today's Retina Surgical Conference. Uh, for our first case, we have a 64-year-old female with blurred vision in her right eye for three months after she was hit by her grandson. A little bit of background, visual acuity was 2400 in the right eye, 2030 in the left at her baseline. Pressures were normal in both eyes. She did have a prior history of cataract extraction and trabeculectomy in the right eye, the eye that was hit. Uh, and her exam showed a dislocated intraocular lens. No other trauma. She had a little bit of a hyphema here. You can see from the uh, anterior segment view in the OR. Um, so just kind of a, a low ball question uh, for our attendings here. What choice of technique would you choose for this patient? Um, could you do an ACI well in someone with glaucoma, or would you prefer to do a sutured lens or Yamani when you do an exchange? I mean, the one big thing is if you want to, if the trab is functioning, you probably, superior is where you usually make your incision because you sit superior, but you're probably going to have to make a temporal in this case. So um, I personally would do a scleral fixated IOL, but with a temporal approach, either sit temporal um, or do the vitrectomy and then uh, move to temporal position. I agree. <coughs> the, the, I also, f how old is this patient? She's 64. 64. So in this particular patient probably go in the direction of a sutured IOL, but let's say if she was 90 years old, superior pleb is functioning, and uh, the nerve was reasonable, and talk to the glaucoma uh, person and make sure the trab is functioning, there's nothing wrong with putting an ACIOL from the temporal approach either. So I'm, I'm open to both. Yeah, I mean, if glaucoma says okay for ACIOLs, and often they do, then you can do whatever you like. Can you make a clear corneal incision with a trabeculectomy superiorly? I would make a scleral tunnel um, with the uh, ACI wells, like a small scleral tunnel. So uh, my preference is superior, but in this case, it would have to be temporal. But I would go with a cortex fixated lens in this case. Yeah, I'm, I'm not, to be honest with you, I'm not afraid to go temporally, and I'm not afraid to go clear corneal either. Okay. Um, so I've approached it both ways. And to be honest with you, I started out with. Um, um, with tunnel, but I've switched over to clear cornea at this point. You can also just make it oblique. If you're going to do a scleral fixated uh, IOL, you could just do it like inferotemporal and supranasal in this case and just avoid the bleb. And, and I've done that with tubes. Uh, you just got to like uh, sort of make it a little oblique. Just a review for Dr. Chang. It's a 64-year-old um, lady who had a dislocated intraocular lens. Um, so one of the things that I wanted to go over as we look through the video are a couple of points. Um, first is we kind of talked about the, the TRAB. We decided to uh, make a clear corneal incision through a, for a sick, fixated uh, scleral sutured IOL superiorly um, with the ports avoiding the TRAB temporally and nasally. Um, one of the things I wanted to discuss is um, as we're making the pyridomy here, and then we use some cautery for hemostasis. Um, how do you, when you're measuring the trocars, how do you ensure that you're going to get good centration? I know some people have different techniques. Um, how far back do you go, and how are, how are you ensuring that you're getting good centration of the lens at the end of the case? Um, well, the AO optic is a little bigger than the MX60, so you have a little wiggle room. Uh, I agree with you, especially when there's a trab and scarred conjunctiva. If you don't measure the first mark very well, then uh, you're going to be off. So I think that first mark is probably most key. And then I personally go three millimeters back and then four to five millimeters apart. The uh, trocars on the cannula will have a four millimeter mark or you can use the uh, calipers as you, as you did here. Um, you have some wiggle room too. If it's a little off, you can make one side a little tighter, but uh, you're right, you know, if the sclerotomies are off, uh, the lens could be 
decentered, uh, which which is a little bit of a problem. But usually, I find when that happens, it's usually the superior inferior axis rather than um, nasal temporal. So it's when you measure your two millimeters, two millimeters, or um, kind of continuing here. So here we're measuring. Speed it along a little bit. We're doing a vitrectomy here. Luckily, the patient had a flat, despite her trauma, had, you know, retina was flat. There were no tears or holes. Um, I'm going to pause here. How complete of a vitrectomy do you do? Do you have to do a really close shave, or can you leave some gel there? Um, well, you don't want to get an RD if you put in the acreos, so I try to remove as much gel as safe. Obviously, if the lens was more dislocated than it is, sometimes the view can be a problem, so you, you may do some anterior vitrectomy, remove the lens, put a temporary 10 nylon, and then complete the vitrectomy. Um, I think you definitely want to take the gel out um, uh, under these cannulas and, and those sclerotomies, so I, I do focus there a little bit more. Uh, and, if, and if you see any tears or uh, suspicious uh, areas, I, I laser them at the time of the surgery. And if there is an RD intraoperally, then I usually postpone the lens and come back at another time. Is that how most people do it, stage it, if you find any tears or RDs? Don't choose to do it at once. Yeah, my feeling is stage it, but you can't go wrong with either approach. The other piece is also, I mean, when you do the vitrectomy, you got to look at the risk and benefit. I mean, if there's a lot of um, lattice pathology down below, I mean, you want to trim it, but you, wanna, you don't want to trim it to the point where you're creating a tear either, so there's a balancing act when you go through the vitrectomy. You just want to make sure the gel is not coming through the lens into the AC, but just do enough, but not to create tears. Yeah, I think clearing the vitreous around the sclerotomies is important because you're passing instruments through there, of course, but you also have to remember postoperatively that, you know, the wounds, uh, you don't want any vitreous wicking in there where the suture is running. So we ended up making, like I mentioned, kind of an off-center clear corneal incision. Um, and widened it a little bit with a 2.75 millimeter keratome. Uh, we used M the MST set to basically Pac-Man the intraocular lens out. Um, depressed exam was normal. And then I wanted to stop here because I think this is one of the most um, interesting and important aspects of the case, which is, um, well, I guess first, um, how do you prevent spaghetti here? <laughs> and second, um, I think it's interesting to hear people's techniques to prevent eyelet fracture. Um, that's been a big thing recently in the literature, and there's a lot of you know, different things that I've heard about the most important step to prevent eyelet fracture, so I wanted to ask the attendings, you know, I guess those two questions. First, how are you preventing yourself from getting all tangled up here? And secondly, um, how do you prevent eyelet fracture, especially in MX6CE? Um, I mean, I've seen one case where I personally, it got all twisted and I grabbed the eye well by the eyelet and it fractured. And this was before it was reported and I was like surprised by that. And I just opened another one and rethreaded it. It didn't get, um, um, it wasn't spaghetti and, and then it just went in. But. Uh, you know, I think some of our colleagues, they like to fold the leading haptic over the initial knot and uh, kind of like a taco and get in that way. I think with this lens, it's better to thread one side and then pull those stitches up really tight and then you can see the other two sides. And if you need to twist the lens in the iris plane or AC, you can, and then you can just thread the remaining two. Whereas with the acreos, I usually thread three of them um, and leave one uh, not thread uh, through the cannula, and then that usually, if there's any twist, you'll identify it very easily, even if there's a small pupil, and then you just pull the last one through, and then you're usually done at that point. So with the acreos, you're threading the like the temporal haptic, for example, while it's in the eye? Uh, well, I'll thread three of them before I put in the AC and leave one not thread. Oh, Whereas understand. with this one, I'll just thread two and then thread the temporal side once it's in the eye. Gotcha. 
I think with the MXCC, usually you get in trouble when you either are pulling both sides too tight, and that's when a fracture can happen, uh, or when there's spaghetti, as you said, or rotation, and then you end up doing more manipulation. So the more manipulation leads to more stress on that little area. So I think most, I, I don't do as much MX60, but uh, yeah, I agree. Colleagues will recommend to, to, to put that uh, leading haptic, tuck it in uh, as it goes in, and then just fix one side first, and um, then deal with the other. Um, so we decided to thread both. Um, and then we threaded the first uh, the first cortex through the nasal aspect first. And then made the, the taco. Um, one thing that, this was a case with Dr. Chu, one thing that he had me do that I thought was really interesting was tie the ends first so that you, when you are basically keeping the cortex taut, you only have to pull uh, one, basically one unit, as opposed to having to pull, kind of keep track of both strings at once. Um, and then we were able to thread the, the second half. Um, when you're, I think one of the most important things that I was, I have an article from AJO that was just published in, in January looking um, at eyelet fracture. Um, this was a helpful thing that I, I thought he went through with me, which was that, um, Basically, you're trying to minimize the manipulation of the of the Gore-Tex running through the eyelet, and so he had me cut the end of this suture instead of just threading it all the way through. Um, in terms of when you're tying down the sutures, anything in particular you pay attention to to kind of prevent stress on the eyelets? It doesn't have to be as the, the acros is more like a, like gummy, and it will like stretch. This lens does not made of that material, so you you don't need it to be um, super tight. Like I feel like in the beginning or when you're first doing these cases, you're like oh, you want it really tight. It it's okay if the lens is like slightly mobile, um, and and I think over tightening is the problem too, because that will lead to some stress over time as well. Uh, one of the things that I've noticed some intersegment surgeons do is that they'll do a slip knot here. Does anyone use that approach? Does, do you feel like that helps at all? Only if you're really good at slip knots, because um, <laughs> we've seen plenty of situations where it either is leading to a tilt because it's not balanced on each side, slip knot wise, or it, I've seen it unravel as well. Post operatively, you don't want to see that, but it happens. Um, the last thing I wanted to discuss is this: uh, the article from uh, AJO, which basically looked at the 25 eyelet fractures across different. It was multi-institutional. Um, case series, and 20 occurred postoperatively. And I think the most important aspect of the article was the five that occurred intraoperatively, because I feel like that was a real-time analysis of how these islet fractures occurred. Um, interestingly, they didn't really find an association between you know, the leading haptic or the trailing haptic. They occurred in both. Um, they, bo they all kind of, all of the authors kind of felt that this occurred while they were doing the, the process of tightening um, the sutures. Uh, one thing that they suggested was potentially closing the uh, clear corneal incision first so that the, the eye has a normal uh, pressure before tying off the Gore-Tex. And the reason they felt was because then if, you suddenly, if you're hypotenuse while you're tying off the Gore-Tex and suddenly it inflates, then you're tightening it uh, all of a sudden. So I thought that was a helpful tip that um, going forward. Um, otherwise, the, the post-operative fractures occurred about three months after. Any thoughts on why this happens three months later? Maybe just a cheese wiring effect. I think that, you know, the Gore-Tex is a super strong. Try to break it next time you pull on it. It's super strong. So it just needs to be tense there, and it can just start to kind of, you think of an UGG syndrome type thing, but again, it's just, it's just rubbing and rubbing. Um, there's movement of the lens too. So there is some movement and that's potentially a cause. I mean, this, this lens is not as strong. They've uh, done some follow-up in vitro studies with a, a, a little device that measures the force you can put on it, like 
the force you can use to break a 27 gauge forcep, the force to break this island, the force to break AO60, and it's like orders of magnitude different between AO and, and this. And so I think there's some debate. Some people won't use this lens. The AO is not perfect either. Uh, the optic is bigger in the AO, so I think you have a lot more wiggle room and probably better optical quality. But yes, if you get RD, you can get opacification. Um, which doesn't gas. which doesn't happen. I mean, it, it, it happens, but it doesn't happen all the time. Right. And so I personally like the way that that has a better optic and, and it's just more predictable. But of course, it's your choice and people get used to what they do. I mean, the thing we didn't discuss too, if this lady had very bad glaucoma, um, AFIC is disabling to people, but um, you know, an AFIC at contact is another option. Probably not great with a TRAB uh, or infection risk with a TRAB, so I don't love it. But um, you know, in, in some situations, AFIC is not a bad option. <laughs> Good point. Um, moving on to our next case, 20-year-old 20, uh, 20 female with blurred vision in her left eye for one month. This is her optos. Um, she essentially has a small optic disc pit you can see here and a pooling of subretinal fluid superiorly. It just crosses through the fovea there. Her vision is 2040. You can see that subretinal fluid better on the fundus autofluorescence. And then here's a, a raster cut through the subretinal fluid. You can see it's just barely starting to affect the fovea. She has a fair amount of schesis here. Um, so a little bit about optic dyspit maculopathy. It can be a congenital or acquired. Uh, it's thought to be a herniation of dysplastic retinal tissue that it can extend through the lamina carosa, and the serous detachment with or without schesis happens in about a quarter to three quarters of patients. The pathogenesis is thought to occur, um, there are two different hypotheses. One is that vitreous traction allows liquefied vitreous to get underneath the retina. Um, people report this because they often say that the PVD is absent when the subretinal fluid appears, and then it, it may resolve with P PVD or PPV, um, although some people dispute this because even after PPV, it can recur. Um, and during PPV, it's often a tight adherence of the hyloid at that area. The second hypothesis is that there's alterations in the translaminar pressure gradients between the vitreous and CSF. Um, so two different thoughts on why this occurs. In our patient, what would be your next step? What's your choice to, you know, uh, for our patient with 2040 vision? It's kind of just starting to affect the fovea. Would you go in and operate for this patient? Is she symptomatic? She is symptomatic, yeah. And what's the onset of her symptoms? It's about a month, she said. In general, you don't want to go inside a 20 year old fake a guy, um, would be one overarching principle. Um, I'd need to see progression over time uh, anatomically and symptomatically to consider doing a vitrectomy. Um, In-office procedures that have been tried for this include um, laser uh, around the temporal aspect of the pit. Uh, I've done that. I'd say it typically does not work too well. Uh, other people have tried uh, intravitreal gas bubble injections in the office and those have been mixed too. I don't have much experience. I don't know if my partners have. Yeah, I've, in this setting, I, I would agree, and I would try laser. Um, I've had a few patients where it has not resolved it, but has temporized it and stopped progression. At least they were having some progression over the course of the next three months from there, and it halted it for six, seven years now. So. It may work to halt it, but eventually this can progress, and so you have to kind of drill that into them that uh, they may need surgery. But surgery is not a home run by any means in this situation. It's actually very variable, so I think I agree. You have to be very cautious. I, I agree. I would play it conservative at this point, see how it progresses, but I do agree with laser treatment. <clears throat> and if you are going to do laser treatment, I'll do three rows around the pit not real hot, I mean grayish uh, type takes, and three rows around it, and then see what happens. 
Um, so for, for this patient, we ended up following her for a little bit. I have an OCT of her before image later in the deck, um, unfortunately not right here. Uh, but she did progress to having some subretinal fluid right underneath the, the fovea. And it was about three months later. So at the time, she was getting pretty symptomatic. She was about still 20, 40, 20. She actually was okay, 20, 40, 20, 50. But the decision was made to, to undergo surgery. Um, any thoughts about, one more thing before we get to the video, any thoughts about Diamox? Has anyone tried this? Does this work? I was going to say you can try that as a temporizing measure too. You know, it could potentially reduce the fluid to allow a better juxtapapillary laser. But, um, you know, I, th I think the more interesting question is if you're going to do surgery, what are you going to do? Because uh, there's some big series in Japan that say you should just do VIT gas, which, you know, as long as the PVD induction goes well, this could be you know a ten minute case, which is uh, pretty nice. Uh, but then other people are doing things to plug the hole, ILM flaps, uh, you know, fibrin glue, things like that, um, and, and that may allow the pit to be sealed either temporarily or long enough to allow the serous detachment to resolve, um, and, and then place laser either intraoperatively or, or at a time in the future. Yeah, I think we'll. We should discuss that. I think that we need to categorize these patients as young or older, PVD status included. And I think they're different. For a young patient, Dr. Ching, what do you prefer? Just straight PVB. Just pull the, get it, get it, get it up, and put a gas bubble in. And that's always worked. Um, I had a slew of these in a row for whatever reason. Um, and I think less is more. But I think the older patients that already have a PVD, that the pathophysiology of that. Uh, is a little bit different, and that's where you probably need to be doing other maneuvers. Alan, if you have a young patient and you do the PPV, uh, never had laser treatment, it's progressing, do you add laser during the? Uh... Uh, I wouldn't. I, I don't like to do it in the OR because it's. I can be more um, uh, precise with the slit lamp. I, I just think the OR is, t is tough to do that, and I know you have some fluid to buffer the, per uh, the, the peripapillary um, bundle of nerves, but I think uh, it's it's not as precise. So, preference would it be to place it early, early on before surgery, actually. And the other key we need to discuss is once you do the surgery, and wait for the subretinal fluid to go away, how long do you wait? I mean, meaning, it hits yeah. these type of things is a chronic problem. It's not going to go away right away. Sometimes yeah, it takes three to six months, so you got to wait patiently. The ones that I've had uh, six to 12 months, yeah. I think the other thing is you know, a lot of meetings, people talking about puckers, take the ILM. We make a lot of things look better on OCT, but I mean, if you look preoperative at the anatomy of this case, the, the retina is thin. You know, I think you got to think a little more deeply about peeling the ILM in a young person, risk of retinal atrophy, glaucoma long term. I mean, I, I understand the point. I like doing it, but. You know, this patient has many, many years ahead of them. So you got to think about what the long term morbidity of that could be as well, or an interoperative macular hole, which could make this patient worse. I agree completely with Michael's comments. The, um, I'll tell you my thoughts. Uh, acetazolamide, you can try, it's not going to work. Um, laser, you can try. And the comment I want to make about laser is that the extent to which you do the laser, um, is has been influenced by some of the older studies like the histoplasmosis laser study you can actually laser uh, multiple clock hours on the temporal aspect of the nerve going to the fovea and still have preserved central vision so if you're going to try it don't be afraid of the number of clock hours like almost six clock hours of temporal significant laser and and you can still have um, good central visual function do you the, do one row or multiple rows? I, I'll probably do multiple rows. Sometimes it's hard to take <clears throat> get uptake because of the fluid. Mm -hmm. um, um, Michael's, uh, Alan's comment about doing vitrectomy only, I've been influenced by the Japanese reports of just doing vitrectomy, but I find it difficult not to laser when I'm there. And what I'll use is a continuous laser so I can titrate the laser response uh, based on the intensity of the laser and how close I get with the aiming beam. Um, Michael's comment about peeling ILM is, is really important. Um, both Regillo and I over the years have talked about the um, cases where we were in younger patients just like this, where we peeled the ILM to try and f 
and flap over. Now we peeled all the way over the fovea and both of us have gotten macular holes mm. in younger patients. So if you're gonna peel and try and flip, fold back and reflect the ILM to plug the hole, um, don't bring it over the central macula uh, would be my suggestion. Um, but I, I, in general, do, I'm leaning towards doing vitrectomy only in these younger patients and trying without laser, but I, I must admit it's tempting to do laser when you're there. So um, this case actually was with Dr. Rigillo, um, and he ended up wanting to peel the ILM, so we'll kind of go through the case now. Um, we ended up going to surgery, a little bit of a core vitrectomy. Obviously, the young patients, we added uh, triessence, very difficult PVD induction, as expected. Yes, most retina surgeons, uh, once they start operating the eyes without a PVD with a vitrectomy, um, it, it's, it's not a fun thing. <laughs> finally, finally got it up. Took it out to the mid-periphery. Shaving some periphery, mid-periphery. What gauge is this? This is 23. So here he did, I'd be interested to hear his thoughts, maybe we can ask him at a later date, um, why he ended up deciding to, to peel ILM in this patient. He, um, he felt like at the time of, in the OR that, the, that her pathology was so significant that he really wanted to, to try and add a barrier uh, in the optic disc pit, so he decided to peel. And we did take it over the fovea here. We used a little bit of viscoat. Um, thoughts on viscoat versus to seal? Do they both work e equally? Does it matter? Has anyone tried either? Not really. I don't think it matters. Viscoat's available. Just use it. <laughs> I, would use. I mean, it's interesting the, the, the pathophysiology thoughts, there's some kind of leak, and so, you know, physically putting something is, is there some attraction or current that seals the hole um, you know well, the glue is probably dripping down and patient supine you know it's going into that area maybe plugging it but the ILM you know usually as an adherent usually we see flaps they want to move around <laughs> so uh, we certainly see the pictures afterwards ILM flaps and macular holes or even in a pit they show it going in there so perhaps there is some kind of current once you remove the vitreous in it plugs it up, but, uh, you know, I'm not sure how it actually stays in there, mm -hmm. um, but it, it's great when it works and it plugs up the hole. Dr. Jacobs is talking about like the very beginning of the video. Would you, attending, mind just pointing out when you're doing laser, where exactly you would treat this? Maybe oh, we can actually... Maybe the, yeah. <laughs> That's the, the next okay. part of the video. Air fluid exchange, so pit is infratemporal here. Yeah, I would be okay lasering uh, three o'clock hours, maybe even a little bit more. What I would do differently than him is instead of going on repeat is I'd do continuous. Continuous. Just so you can titrate a little bit more. Yeah. You also have to remember the video shows the green laser, but when you're under the scope, you're not going to get the green flashback, so you're going to see the spots a little easier. A little bit better. And we just did one row in that case, but about six o'clock hours, like you were mentioning. Um, so this is the before picture that, as I was mentioning, basically a lot more progression underneath the fovea um, and the after picture. Um, a little bit of resolution, but I believe, as Dr. Sibling was mentioning, this is only about a month or two after, and so it's very slow to resolve here. In this particular case, I'm not opposed to starting them on Diamox either. I mean, it may do something, it may not. It's not going to harm. So, because this subretinal fluid is going to take a long, long time. Yeah, the pre-op counseling is really important in these cases. You just have to explain to them the time frame, explain to them what to expect, explain to them that uh, repeat surgeries are sometimes needed or often may have a higher chance to be needed. 
I'm a little afraid of the macular hole phenomenon. Maybe Virgilio doesn't remember, but what <laughs> developed was um, <laughs> these macular skittic spaces wound up, um, what she wound up developing an outer macular hole first that then went full thickness. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so the, you, you're thinking maybe the skis is what, pretty What I would do in this case is PVD induction, mm -hmm. um, mid out to the equator only, and then stop myself from doing laser and get out and probably put a gas bubble in and then get out. I probably wouldn't laser at this point. And if it comes back, you can always go back. You can go again. back. You don't want to have to go um, back, but you probably could. But I agree with Alan. I, I probably yeah. wouldn't have done the ILM. I may have considered doing a light laser and get out. So there's multiple variations of how we approach you. I don't think one is I can't say one is one approach is wrong, but it's multiple variations. Each of us have had our own experiences for the bad outcomes to stay away from that particular case and then fine tune it. But right, and and one of the reasons is she started with pretty good vision, so I'd be a little bit more minimalist Pretend, here. Yeah. I've also done in the older patients with chronic fluid and worse vision, done retinotomies and drainage to to get rid of this and. I can make the anatomy look better, but the vision is often not so great, uh, ultimately, anyway. Those are really helpful insights. Um, luckily, her vision improved a tiny bit to 2030, but we're hoping, I guess we're hoping not for a whole. <laughs> yeah, we gotta wait six months to a year. I, I think it looks promising. Yeah. I mean, look, the, the intramacular um, skittic macular schesis is improving, so. <clears throat> Uh, case three. So we have a 32-year-old male with congenital vision loss in both eyes from labors. Uh, just a little bit of background, labors is the most common cause of blindness in children. It occurs in an incidence of two to three per 100,000 children. In 2017, the FDA approved the Luxterna treatment for the treatment of biallelic RPE65 uh, mutation, which is associated with LCA2. Um, and this accounts for just a, a small minority of mutations. So a bunch of companies, including the company we're going to discuss, is looking at um, recombinant adenoviral vector uh, therapies for different types of labors mutations, including LCA1, which affects one in five children uh, and is caused by the mutation in GUCY2D, which is a, a guanylate cyclase. Um, it's an autosomal recessive mutation. Uh, so this is the study by uh, Atsena. It's phase one, two. There's about 15 participants, and basically looking at safety with only uh, with secondary endpoints of best corrected visual acuity and sensitivity testing. Um, so uh, I did this case with Dr. Ho. I think he has some um, important insights into how to, to go about it, but I'll start playing the video. And then um, we did this on the ingenuity. Um, so kind of at the end of this video, we can discuss people's thoughts on using ingenuity in the operating room. Um, so we put the ports in here. Um, and a core vitrectomy. And then in this young patient, in induction of PVD with triessence. How aggressive are you with induction of PVD, Dr. Ho? Aggressive. <laughs> aggressive. Um, are you carrying it peripherally or? No, but it's, it's imperative to induce the PVD <clears throat> in order to access the subretinal space to deliver the gene uh, therapy. So you have to get the PVD off. You have to get the vitreous off in the particular area where your 41 gauge cannula is going to go. And the uh, typical maneuvers of, of intravitreal triamcinolone and then drunk walking with your um, cutter over the nerve to try and grab a good handle of the vitreous gel into the cutter and pulling it up into the cutter gives you the best chance of inducing a PVD. Um, but it takes some time. 
Uh, and then there's the issue of residual thin cortical gel that you have to get up. So to answer your question, you have to be, if you could just elevate the PV, the vitreous and remove cortical gel from the surface of the retina where you're going to inject, then that would be fine. But you have to do this. And you can see the shadow lines coming across. And we pull back with the light pipe and try and get a wider view because you want to be very sure in a young patient to elevate only to the equator, not really anterior to the equator where vitreous base insertion can be more posterior in these weird eyes and start inducing multiple retinal tears circ circumferentially at the insertion of the posterior, posterior aspect of the vitreous base. So carefully but aggressively. Um, one just side comment, so we'll talk a little bit more about the ingenuity, but this particular feature of the ingenuity allows you to change the color actually as you're operating uh, of the screen in front of you. So um, we had changed it, the, the uh, device rep recommended that we change it previously to a yellower color, um, which he felt like would help with separation of layers. Did you notice any difference or not really? Um, I don't know. I'm not really looking too much at the colors. I'm yeah. At what I'm at. <laughs> um, we found it actually pretty helpful for. They have an ICG. It's it makes your ICG stain a little bit brighter. Um, I'm not sure that it's one of the huge features of the ingenuity. Um, so here we're doing a little more of a peripheral shave. And inspection. Fortunately, this patient did not have any tears or holes. <laughs> And then do you always use the flex loop here? Um, in older patients for <clears throat> gene therapy for wet AMD, I typically don't. But in younger patients where it is much more difficult to get subretinal blebs, uh, I think one of the main reasons, although we saw the vitreous elevate and the induced Weiss ring, there can be residual cortical gel. And I don't know if the video will show it, but we identified it, and it will plug that 41-gauge cannula so you will not get a bleb. And you'll think, what's wrong with my tubing? What's wrong? Is there an air pocket in my subretinal uh, med-1 injector? And it'll just take a little bit of vitreous gel to plug that. So um, what I've gone to is after PVD inject induction, repeat triamcinolone staining, and then flex loop just in the area where we want to enter into the subretinal space. This particular uh, study wants the bleb to go into the central macula, which is <clears throat> um, where we want some transduction, transfection and then transduction of the gene product um, centrally where the labors is occurring. Rebecca, just two quick things. Uh, this is a great PVD induction in what looks like a really challenging case. Sometimes those can, that can be the most difficult step of all your different surgeries. Uh, using 23 over 25 gauge people is helpful because you're going to get more suction to be able to lift the hyoid. Another nice <clears throat> tip sometimes is being able to just use a bent 25 gauge needle, put it on the end of your soft tip, and kind of get behind that if you're able to elevate just a small bit pierce that posterior hyoid to just elevate it a little bit. But this was a great technique here, too. Yeah, I d um, my default is 23 gauge, unless I'm doing a lens suture or a, Same. a Gupta sharp skin study patient. And I'll get 25. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> By the way, 25 is shorter than 23. Yeah. So if you're a right-handed surgeon doing a left eye macular peel, where you've got to go over the bridge of the nose, it's Think about using the 23 because it's it's a couple it's it's longer and getting reaching over the bridge of a nose with your dominant hand to do macular work is easier with the 23. Totally, uh, I use 23. I think that's a good technique. Uh, a bent pick uh, or a bent need 25 needle, creating a barb, and then going to aspiration is another way. Is is my last uh, resort method to get a PVD. I agree with Michael. I, I like putting a contact lens on before going to any other instruments. You, you're going to, oftentimes it is the position, especially with a trainee, they're just not close enough to where the hyaloid is. Um, 
I, I don't find a huge difference in terms of the suction 23 to 25 and some of the 25 cutters are actually shorter port to tip distance but in general I'd say it's easier with 23. <laughs> So cleaning off that that high, potential hyaloid schesis, do you ever bevel the needle in order to, or the cannula in order to get it in? Yeah, sometimes. Andy Lauer at Oregon, they've done more kids than, than we have. He'll do that sometimes with the Van Ness scissors to, to get that uh, injection. In general, you don't need to do it. And you need to, you need to um, go slowly. Remember, this is not an AMD patient with a normal uh, or relatively normally thick macula. These labors patients have really thin macula, so I was afraid of blowing a hole into the macula, which which I've done. Um, so you go very slowly. When do you stop? Um, I stopped at the <clears throat> the study protocol was uh, was 200 microns of subretinal fluid. And so we stopped. We wanted it to go to the central macula, and we, we achieved that. The little residual um, triamcinolone obscured a direct visualization of what was happening in the fovea. And I was just hoping that there wasn't going to be a little foveal hole. And it turns out there wasn't. But to go, going slowly is, is important here. Um, and we got lucky, because you can't control you cannot really control so well the direction in which the bleb will progress, um, but we're able to get lucky here. In a in a wet AMD patient, we're going to we move these blebs now inferiorly <clears throat> because one of the side effects is RPE um, changes in the in the geography of the bleb, but also because the bleb will migrate uh, at, with gravity. Um, we've seen pigmentary change through the fovea, and so we'll do these inferiorly now. Still coming across the fovea or not? Mm. No, staying okay. away. Staying because away. in that case, you're just creating the biofactory <clears throat> from the RPE cells, and it doesn't have to be a transfection and transduction of central um, macular photoreceptors. Understood, understood. Um, so in our last couple of minutes, um, just talking about the ingenuity, um, any thoughts on using it? Do people like it, not like it? Any, has anyone else used it in the, in the past? I think it's very good for trainees, especially like diabetic TRDs, because often you'll be like, hey, turn the cutter this way. You could literally show it on the screen. It's very helpful, and I I've heard that feedback from trainees as well, like, because you're saying something in the scope, like, go superior, go this way, and it can be confusing, especially if it's a difficult case, but you can just show it on the screen. And, and then the macular work, I mean, it's just a really big image. I mean, it's it's nice, and, and there's a little bit of depth of field, you know. Oftentimes, you're putting your, a little bit of wrist pressure on the wrist rest, the bed moves a little bit, you'd be refocusing, but you have a little bit more leeway with uh, these systems, which I think is nice, and then can contribute to less operative times. Yeah, as a as a trainee, I felt like it was um, I felt like it was great for posture and really good for macular work. I found it hard to learn peripheral work. Um, that was where I felt like it was it was hardest because you really have to keep the eye in, in primary, um, even for for like very very anterior peripheral work. So that was a little more challenging learning, um, but it was it was nice to be able to kind of. Um, look at the screen and have everyone in the room, including the scrub techs, be able to see it. Um, and they became very involved in the process as well. Um, so just some, some pros and cons, ergonomics, better teaching, extended depth of field, as you mentioned, Dr. Klufus. The color profiles are you know plus minus, but the ICG one I thought was the most helpful. Um, and then one thing that anterior segment surgeons are, are talking about is that there's a little bit of lag. So when you're doing suturing underneath the, the ingenuity, it's, it's a little bit harder to, it, it lags behind you just a little bit. So it's a little, uh, not quite as easy as doing the macular work. Um, and then obviously the cost of, ac uh, of acquisition. Any other thoughts about this? Um, I think it was Mu, Murtaz Adam did uh study when he was here on light um, levels. You can use much lower light levels for your light pipe. And also, definitely the, 
don't do an eye-wall case for your first one. <laughs> it's super hard. That the leg, I don't know. I, I, it makes me seasick. I, I've done <laughs> a few inside. You have another system here now, too, the Artivo. I, I think we're using it today, whoever's in the OR with me in the room. So uh, I think the lag's a little less with that one because it's pretty popular among some of the cataract surgeons. Interesting. Very cool. Interested to see it. There's a, um, there's a definite learning curve, and so <clears throat> the activation energy to use this in a busy day when you're not used to riding a new bicycle um, will be significant, but white balancing in the beginning, focusing in the beginning are really important to this. I think this, I think this shines for teaching, for ergonomics, as you described. For macular work, it's superior, and what I've seen from two of our fellows that are just, you know, they're learning surgery, but they just jump into, I just throw them on to, into the system. It's, they're completely natural, which is, which is encouraging. Um, and I think for peripheral work, there's, de there's a definite cost. You, you get great field of view, but you get, you lose, uh, uh, laser aiming beam, for example, we had a case um, Monday where John was, you know, it was difficult to see the laser aiming beam. That's that's definitely something that um, I think you can get better with experience just because you kind of know your distance of your laser and getting perpendicular with your aiming beam to your tissue, um, but you don't see it as well as <clears throat> through the oculars. Um, the hyperstereopsis in the macula makes it, and you know, since a lot of the work is macular, um, I think can be can be very helpful. I like what I'm going to do is get a a little laser pointer um, so that I can sit there and say, <laughs> get this <laughs> peel, touch this, pinch this, turn your port here. Here's where the peg is in this traction diabetic. Um, the, the system's gotten better since the last time we demoed it. Um, you can see some of the data on, of, the, of the constellation. So the constellation's fed into there. The videos are, are excellent quality, I think. I think they're, they're, they're better. Um, and we can, we can actually do 3D. You can play a 3D video and then put in 3D glasses and do Maybe we'll do that for Atlantic Coast for, uh, we've done that before elsewhere, for bring a couple of the monitors in and have people kind of look at it like in a 3D movie theater. So, um, so I'd encourage people to try it. Thank you so much. Thank you for everybody. Appreciate your help. Thank you.